Shall we start soon? I think we should start because already it's five minutes over. Okay, you start with welcome. Okay. Yeah, we should start. So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to webinar 125. This is Pragati Sabre, your today's webinar coordinator. I welcome all the senior panelists, our esteemed speaker, Mr. Sandeep Shah, Mr. Uljan, our moderator for today, Professor Dr. Tanuja Bandiwadekar, and all the participants present here. Today's topic of webinar is State of Art Approach for Earthquake Resistant Modern Buildings by Using Dampers and Base Isolators. So in next 20 minutes, we'll get insight knowledge from our speaker who has been there and done it. So I request all of you to be there till the end of the session. Uh, after which we'll have a question answer session for 10 minutes in or in which all your questions and doubts will be answered. So you all are requested to put your questions in QA box and not in the chat box. Also, I would request all the uh, panelists to please mute uh, their cell themselves to keep the quality of the sound constant during the webinar. So let's welcome Mr. Jayan Kulkarni, uh, today's webinar convener, who is the founder member and managing director at Epicons. He is graduate and postgraduate from VGTI, Mumbai University. His areas of interest are codal provisions, seismic retrofitting, tall buildings, concrete mix design, advanced MDT and evaluation, Conservation of Heritage Structure and Indian Aesthetics. Epicons has received many awards from prestigious organization under his guidance. One of the most prestigious award is Centenary Industry Excellence Award in the year 2019 by Institute of Engineers. Now, before we move ahead uh, with the lecture, I would uh, briefly introduce EFC under which today's activity is being conducted. EFC is a knowledge sharing platform since 1999. This training activity is conducted under, under the umbrella of Epicons Consultants Private Limited. This is ISO 9001-2015 certified company. And one of the defined objective of the company is imparting technical knowledge to our staff, engineering fraternity, and society at large. And the inspiration for this goes back to late engineer AP Remedios, and this is how journey of AFC started back in 1999. Here are our thought leaders, Dr. V. N. Gupchu, Professor M. G. Gargi, Engineer N. N. Shikhande, Dr. Sudhir Jain, Engineer Alpha Set, and Professor Dr. Yogendra Singh. Here are the glimpses of photographs of the workshop which are held in past. Also, we are glad to share that EFC has conducted 17 workshops in last 21 years and 24 webinars in the last 16 months. Here is the overview of all the webinars conducted under EFC. Today we are on 125th and next is on Poetics of Concrete Structures, which is scheduled on 20th November 2021. All these webinars are conducted with the great efforts and inputs from directors and seniors, Mr. Jain Kulkarni, Mr. Anand Kulkarni, Mr. Ravindra Deshpande, Mr. Arvind Parurekar, Mr. Parashar Mughe, and Mr. P.P. Pandey. Last but not the least, I would like to thank Epicon's team uh, who contributed for today's webinar. Thank you all. Now, uh, I would like to introduce today's webinar moderator, Professor Dr. Tanuja Bandiwadekar. His PhD from IIT Bombay, uh, in a subject which is relevant to today's webinar topic, that is vibration control of structures using multiple tool mass dampers. Her area of specialization is structural engineering with a teaching experience of 20 years and research and industry experience is of 22 years. She worked as design engineer with alternative building materials for rehabilitation at Latur earthquake affected area. She also worked as an advisor for New India Assurance Company after Gujarat Kutch earthquake, which occurred in 2001 for claim settlement of Reliance Industries Limited. She attended and presented papers in international and national conferences and journals publication. With this, I welcome Tanuja ma'am and request her to please give preamble. Good 
Good afternoon, one and all. Uh, today's uh, seminar topic is uh, on the uh, state of art approach for uh, design of uh, a quick resistance design using uh, the dampers and isolators. So let us briefly see first uh, the development of earthquake resistant design. So uh, the earthquake resistant design started early uh, in the early 20th century. And with the invention of accelerograph and with the concept of response spectrum, the earthquake resistant design uh, became a part of our code system. After, uh, with the uh, advent of the knowledge of the earthquake engineering and uh, the understanding of the ductility and the hysteresis damping uh, in a system that leads to the capacity design, displacement design, and performance-based design. The Indian Standard Code of Practice for Earthquake Resistance Design is based on the force basis design. That means the structural components of the buildings or for the structures, they are designed in a such a way that they will resist uh, the medium intensity earthquake without any structural damage and high intensity earthquake with a structural damage but without a collapse. The, I'm sorry for that. The uh, four space uh, design is having one shortcoming and that shortcoming is, uh, Madam, please go back to the slide. The uh, four space uh, design of Indian st uh, standard code has limitation, and that is it. The code procedure, if we use the code procedure for the design, an explicit assessment of anticipate performance of the structure is not possible. But that doesn't mean that desired structural performance during the earthquake is not possible with the use of this Indian standard code. That is achieved by uh, using the response reduction factor, then giving the capping on the uh, natural period for a given uh, system, and also by uh, using or by controlling the interstory drift. Next, madam. Now, during the earthquake and the uh, uh, strong winds, the large amount of energy is uh, uh, passed on to the structure. Now, our idea of earthquake design is that this energy should be controlled by some means or dissipated by some means. Now this can be achieved by passive damp devices. What is the need for controlling this response? The response control is required because that will damage the structural components. And if we can dissipate the energy and also control the response, then that will reduce the demand of earthquake forces on the structural components, and also it will try to control the damage to the non-structural component, which is uh, forming a major part of the uh, building structure, especially with respect to the cost. So the passive devices which are used to control the response are dampers and isolators. Now, what is the meaning of isolator? Let's try to understand. The isolators are used to so that the earthquake energy or the earthquake acceleration from the substructure, that is from the footing, will not get transferred to the superstructure. Or if at all it gets transferred, the amount is very less. That means they are isolating the superstructure and substructure by some medium so that the earthquake forces or the earthquake energy is not transferred to the superstructure. 
So the principle of transmissibility comes into the picture when we are designing the isolators. Now let's see what is the meaning of dampers. Dampers are the supplementary damping devices. They are trying to reduce the earthquake force demand on the structural components and thereby trying to uh, uh, also control the interstory drift in a superstructure. Next, please. So the control strategy for isolator or the base isolation system is the period shift or energy dissipation in addition. And the system which are used are natural laminated bearings, lead and high damping rubber bearings, and sliding bearings. Then the next system is the energy dissipation system through the supplementary damping devices where the kinetic energy of the earthquake force is transferred. It's uh, converted to the heat energy and the systems which are used are viscous fluid dampers, viscoelastic dampers, friction dampers, and metallic yield dampers. Then the third is supplementary oscillators for energy transfer, and they are tune mass dampers and tune liquid dampers. The advantage of the passive control system is that they, they can perform even in the case when there is no electricity is available, that is that may the, be the case, especially in case of the strong earthquake. So the passive system are advantageous system for controlling the response of the system to the earthquake forces, as well as for wind forces and thereby reducing the force demand on the structural components. So today's speakers will be uh, giving us the in-depth knowledge about uh, the uh, energy dissipation system that is supplementary damping devices as well as on the isolators. So with this small introduction, I would like to now uh, pass on uh, the uh, dais to the Sandeep Shah for his presentation. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, so let's begin with the first uh, most awaited session of today by Mr. Sandeep Shah. So before we begin, I will give a brief introduction. His engineering career started with him getting commissioned in the Corps of Engineers, Indian Army in 1989. While in Army, he participated in the Kargil War, UN operations in Sierra Leone, Operation Parakram, and anti-insurgency operation, Operation Rakshak. He did his master's in earthquake and civil engineering dynamics from University of Sheffield, UK, and started his engineering consultancy. His company from their Gurgaon office in India is in the undertaking structural design projects in many countries like US, Mexico, Peru, New Zealand, Haiti, and many more. His specialization is performance-based design using dampers, both for new and existing buildings. He has more than 32 years of engineering experience. He has designed many iconic and complex projects, including the ATC Provo at Delhi Airport. He has been instrumental in introducing advanced and latest earthquake protection technologies in India to include dampers, base isolation, tune mass dampers, and earthquake alarm systems. So with this, I would welcome Mr. Sandeep Shah, Country Head and Managing Director at Taylor Devices India. Over to you, sir. So I think you are mute. So you are mute. Okay, I hope uh, everyone can see my screen. And good afternoon to uh, everyone and thanks to Epicon for organizing this uh, webinar. Uh, I hope it just does justice to, as the name suggests and all the engineers are able to walk away with additional information which they can use in the daily lives. So what are dampers all about? We are going to first start with a, you know, a brief video which shows you what energy dissipation can do in structures.
So as we have seen in this video, the, the, it's a toy model, two toy models, which are excited at the base to simulate an earthquake. Now, the, the building with the dampers uh, moves a lot. And also, if you notice, the floors vibrate at a much higher acceleration level. Whereas the building, with, which has got some sort of energy absorption uh, device attached to it, it does not move much. And also the floor uh, accelerations are very, very minimal. Uh, why I'm stressing on floor accelerations is that is in performance-based design, that is becoming a predominant criteria. The reason is that floor accelerations are the principal uh, uh, governing factor for non-structural damage. And buildings these days, uh, more than 70 to 75% of the cost component is contained in the non-structural components, whereas 25% of the building component is the structural cost. So these days, structural engineers are being asked to not only protect the structural component, but also to protect the non-structural component, which means they that if a structural engineer is able to limit the floor accelerations below a certain uh, uh, threshold, he will be able to protect not only the structural uh, components, but also the non-structural components, thereby adding immense value to the project and to the owners. So where do, uh, where do dampers find use in buildings? So uh, buildings that are targeting immediate occupancy and operational performance, you know, that's where you can use dampers. Buildings which target reduced floor accelerations so as to minimize non-structural uh, damage, they, they are a potential candidate for dampers. Hospitals, post-emergency use buildings, important office buildings. Why I'm saying important office buildings, a lot of businesses don't want business interruption even if there is a high magnitude earthquake. So it, it basically implies that the place from where businesses function should be operational even after a very, very large earthquake. Now, this can only happen if you prevent structural damage and non-structural damage to the building, which leads you to dampers and base isolation. Buildings that require a retrofit or upgrade to the latest building codes, those are existing buildings which, you will, which the owners will want to retrofit or upgrade. Buildings that have gone a change of use. So sometimes the, the a building undergoes a change of uh, uh, use and the importance factor increases certain code provisions increase, safety provisions increase. Now, uh, instead of ripping off the whole building and trying to uh, you know, uh, jacket every column and beam, it is a, a, a very potent technology is to use dampers. Buildings that require drift control. So, you know, buildings that sway uh, during, during seismic events, during wind events, uh, and you want to control the sway, uh, dampers are a very potent solution. Buildings having torsional irregularity. So again, these because it's the building is pivoted at, at one point, moves extensively at the other point, these become very good candidates for dampers. Buildings on stilts, you know, buildings on stilts to protect them from collapsing because of the lower stiffness and on the stilt floors, dampers are a very, very potent uh, uh, use they can have over there. And buildings that have plan and vertical irregularities. So these can also be overcome by using damping. Now, uh, predominantly in the world, there are two codes that are used, ASC 7 and ASC 41. ASC 7 is used for new buildings and ASC 41 is followed for existing buildings. When I take you through the design example, we'll be talking extensively about the provisions contained in these codes. Dampers, these are the cut models, and they're basically two types of dampers. One is having a clevis at one end and a base plate at the other end. That is the top damper that you see. And the other damper has clevis at both ends. So to, to fix them, uh, uh, because of how they get attached to a structure, that's why they are built into different configurations. So when I show you pictures of dampers, damping projects, you'll be seeing both these configurations. Energy absorption. And this is a very, very important aspect of uh, 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 dampers. And ETABS gives you very nice, colorful, easy to understand output of how the dampers are working in the, 
uh, in your in your building so we will be uh, we will be talking about how to produce these graphs and how to use these graphs but what i want to try and bring out over here is that if you see under mc earthquake over on on the left hand side you know you the the dampers are absorbing about 60% of the energy that means 40% is going in the structure whereas in the d in under db conditions the dampers are absorbing about 70% of the energy 30% is going into the structure in terms of quantum of energy mc energy is much greater much much greater but in percentage terms how the structural engineer as a structural engineer we have configured the dampers is that the dampers need to be uh, equally effective under both mc and db and that is the beauty of non linear dampers and we'll be talking a lot about how to design these uh, when i come to the design stage now i've just taken a few examples to just to make the you know make uh, structural engineers understand that how people world over have incorporated dampers and you know various types of buildings and for various purposes so this is a slender building and requiring drift control in one direction because in the other direction there are a lot of shear walls he's put but in in one direction the building stiffness is uh, uh, not not to the required extent and so dampers have been used uh, to add uh, damping in in one direction so that so as to control the building drifts this is a manufacturing facility and it contains uh, equipment that is highly uh, sensitive to floor accelerations so dampers have been used in in uh, this building to control floor accelerations this is a hospital building and the hospital building required a uh, upgrade uh, because because the codes uh, underwent a upgrade so existing uh, hospital building dampers have been installed to upgrade the hospital to the latest codes this is a hospital building in tokyo japan where dampers have been used along with base isolation to control the the movement of the isolators so because the movement of the isolators was crossing um, about 700 mm in this particular case so dampers were installed so as to control the movement the drifts for in in the base isolated project this is a high rise building 181 fremont headquarter to facebook and this contains both seismic and wind dampers so the dampers which are used in this particular building are effective against wind and seismic this is a building in new york uh, 250 west street uh, uh, 250 west 55th street uh, and the the damping system on the top right at the top of the building has been used to protect it against wind forces now this is a very interesting project it is bang near very very extremely close to the Uh, fault line and this to protect this particular building it required uh, a great deal of uh, effort a great deal of energy absorption both by base isolation so do you see a friction pendulum bearing over here and uh, uh, fluid viscous dampers so they have been used and in tandem to each other to control the uh, control the building drifts uh, from and accelerations from from a near fault event so what is why people world over are using dampers so fluid viscous dampers have a very very definite advantage over all forms of dampers in the world so i'll i'm i'll i've tabulated the few over here they improve structural performance where and when needed uh i would all, at this stage i will i will also uh, uh, let all the participants know that uh, you will be getting a lot of material uh, from me i'll be showing what what technical material you will be getting and you will also be getting the organizers will also be sharing with you a copy of my presentation so this presentation also will be sent to you by the organizers uh, on your e on your registered email id uh, so no need to take notes you will get a copy of this presentation also so just if you can pay attention and uh, understand uh, uh, what what the concept is how it is used uh, uh, you will get the study material from the organizers anyway okay so the uh, we were talking of the usp uh, of the dampers and they improve structural performance where and when needed 
Uh, code compliant buildings can be designed at a lower cost. Uh, cost. ASC 7 says that for new buildings, 75% base share can be registered by the structure and the balance uh, can the balance of the base share can be registered by the dampers. In addition, uh, when the 75% base share is applied uh, for uh, as a lateral force, there are no drift limits in the, in the structure. So the drifts can be entirely controlled by the uh, dampers. And because of these clauses, you can actually make slender, flexible buildings using less material, less steel, less concrete, and control the, the drift and the base shear using dampers. Fluid viscous dampers are as good as new, even after a maximum credible earthquake event. All other dampers in the world, any damper that you can think of, friction, metal yield, BRBs, they will require partial or full replacement. But fluid viscous dampers are as good as new, even after a MC event. Not only that, let us, as we, in our warranty clause, uh, so uh, uh, when we share and the way we word our warranty, even if the earthquake is more than MCE, we have a clause saying that the client can get the dampers tested and the, da and the warranty renewed. That means, let us assume that, that there's an MCE event and you have designed dampers for that event. And the, the uh, uh, earthquake comes, which is MC plus 20% or MC plus 25% or MC plus 30%. You can, you, the dampers will still be good, but you, you will need to get them tested uh, in, uh, 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 in our lab and the damper can be renewed. So what I am trying to say here is that even if the forces exceed MCE forces, even then the fluid viscous dampers are as good as new. Uh, nothing happens to them. There's no maintenance and no, uh, no maintenance after installation. And we give a specific certificate saying that there's no maintenance required to dampers. The warranty of the dampers that we give is 35 years plus 15 years, which means after 35 years, we test 10% of the dampers and extend the warranty by another 50 years. The total warranty is 50 years. The life of the damper is 100 years and beyond. And each damper is aerospace quality certified. Dampers increase structural performance and fluid viscous dampers are the only ones which reduces stresses, drifts, accelerations, forces, and base shear in the structure. And all dampers are tested to MC level forces and velocities in front of the client representative before they are delivered. The beauty of fluid, nonlinear fluid viscous dampers is that they work equally efficiently for a very, very small earthquake or a very distant earthquake, you know, which happens many, uh, a, a few thousand kilometers away, but you get, you still get some waves coming and you know, exciting uh, the structure where it is located. A small earthquake, a medium earthquake, you know, long distance earthquake, near fault earthquake, strong earthquake. Nonlinear dampers work equally, equally efficiently. And this this graph on the on the left, which which shows you uh, the red lines and a black line in between, this actually shows that a damper is tested to various uh, you know velocities and how it performs. Where the black line is the ideal and the red line is the ten plus minus 10%, and we'll talk about it a little more when we talk about design. So uh, I mentioned that you will be getting a copy of this presentation. In addition to the copy of the presentation, the organizers of this webinar will share with you the following things. Uh, firstly, are the extracts from chapter 18 of ASC 7, you know, which, which speaks about damper design. There's a very detailed commentary and explanatory notes prepared for structural engineers based on the provisions of ASC 716 so that they understand the provisions in the correct perspective. Uh, no such document till now exists the world over. So this is going to be unique. Uh, structural engineers going through this document will understand each and every aspect of what damper design is all about. Uh, the next document you're going to get is uh, the uh, ETABS example, the commands and the procedure, how to design a damping system using ETABS. 
you also will get a pdf you know this pdf is, says nothing but we'll go about it in detail when i'm showing you the design so it will it it shows the minimum stiffness which is in parallel to the damping system so dampers don't have stiffness but the brace with with which damper is attached to the structure has stiffness so this says uh, you, you know you you cannot have a very flexible and a very weak brace attaching a damper because let's assume the way the brace the steel brace which attaches the damper to the structure is very weak then all the displacements are going to go in the wobbliness of the brace and nothing is going to get transferred into the damper and the damper will not stroke so there has to be a minimum stiffness of the brace and that's what this uh, uh, pdf table tells you all about you are also going to get six uh, time histories these are synthetic time histories and i'll show you how to import and also how to change these to the to your required uh, uh, level of response spectrum uh, using the etab commands you also get a uh, etabs file now this file is to choose the the initial uh, properties initial properties of uh, the the damper and we will I'll, we'll we'll talk about it later so you are you're going to get a copy of this presentation and all these technical material from the organizers okay so before we before we proceed with uh, with the uh, technical documents let's see a video where they have incorporated a damper in a tall building in peru okay so coming to the designing the design of the dampers let us go through some of the provisions of asc 7 um, uh, chapter 18 that talks about damper design and what it means for structural engineer and how he incorporates those provisions into his design so in stage 1 in stage 1 uh, you have to undertake a linear response spectrum analysis to configure the structural members, which is which can be your beams and columns, both dimension, uh, the, the, that is the sizes and the strength. The configured structural system should be able to fulfill the gravity load case. So you, you have to fulfill the gravity load case. What, what as per the Indian codes is 1.5 dead plus 1.5 life. And also, ASC 7 warrants that for new buildings, because for existing building, you can't do anything, but for new buildings, when you are using dampers, the, the building without the dampers should be able to resist 75% of the minimum base shear without any restriction on the drifts, which means that the strength, the building should have enough strength so that it can withstand 75% of the design base shear without any limit to the drifts. Further, ASC also states that let's assume the structural engineer is designing a building which has extreme torsional irregularity or extreme soft story irregularity, then this 75% has to be replaced by 100%. So there's a penalty on the, on the structure if it has torsional irregularity or soft story irregularity which means that even building without the damper needs to have sufficient strength so that it can resist 100% of the base shear. Once you have, you have your minimum uh, criteria achieved, you go to the next stage, 
And the next stage is you start to design the dampers. ETABS has a very uh, fine feature, very fast feature, which is called fast nonlinear analysis. And, and that is used to, uh, to, to configure the dampers. In fast nonlinear analysis, the dampers are modeled as nonlinear, whereas the building structural elements are modeled linear. So FNA is a very quick way of performing time history analysis. Uh, it, you don't, uh, you know, it's not a time consuming full nonlinear uh, analysis, which will take, you know, hours and hours to run and then many, many hours or, a, you know, a day or two days to, uh, you know, analyze the results. So this is a very quick way of doing it. And also here I must point out that using dampers in a building and doing time history analysis, even if it is FNA analysis, it's an iterative process and we will talk about it a little more. So a uh, structural engineer may have to do six to eight runs of time history analysis before he can arrive at a optimum uh, damper design for him. Uh, for the for the structure okay so going uh, dwelling into some provisions i have not covered all the provisions in my slides so all the provisions are very elaborately dealt with in the explanatory handbook which will be given to you which will be sent to you by the organizers but i still want to highlight some important provisions here the combination of seismic force resisting system and the damping system is permitted to be used to meet the drift requirements. After the dampers are configured, the seismic force resisting system along with dampers should meet the drift limits. If you are following the Indian codes, then clause 7.11.1.1 of 1893. If you are if following some other code, then the drift uh, limit clause of that particular code would apply. The seismic force sensing system without the damping system, that means as if the damping devices did not exist, must be designed to have a minimum strength of 75%, which I have already spoken about. And this limit is enhanced to 100%. So ASC 7 provides various safeguards and we'll, we'll be talking of more safeguards. So even if you are using a damping system, there are enough safeguards put in by ASC 7 so that the building does not fail or does not go, uh, you know, risk the, the, uh, the there's no risk to the, uh, the people occupying the building. <clears throat> so if it is got horizontal or vertical irregularity, you will have to have the strength of 100% base shear. However, the drift, there is no drift limit when you are using the damping system, the drift limit will be complied by the dampers. The seismic base shear used for design of seismic force system, system shall not be taken less than 100% of the calculate minimum base shear if in the direction of interest the damping system has fewer than two damping devices at each level configured to resist torsion or seismic force resisting system has extreme torsional horizontal irregularity or extreme soft story irregularity. So, <clears throat> ASC 7 says that if you have used lesser than a minimum required number of dampers or you are having torsional irregularity or soft story irregularity, then you please have your, has, have your structure designed so that it can withstand 100% of the lateral uh, forces without any limit on drifts. The damping devices and all other components, what, what are these components? The steel components, namely the insert plates, anchor bolts, gusset box, gusset plate, and the damper brace, are, which are required to connect the damping device to the structural elements, which are the beam, column, shear wall, and the floor slab, shall be designed to remain elastic for maximum credible earthquake loads. Under certain circumstances, the MCE loads are further enhanced. So there are safety provisions in ASC 7 where it says that under MCE event, all components that attach the damper to the building will remain elastic. And under certain conditions, 
this this mc level force is further increased so what are those conditions we will we will come to it non linear response history analysis post, uh, procedures shall use not less than seven sets of design basis of quick time history and seven sets of mc time history which basically means that when you are designing a, a, a damping system you will have to do the ana analysis for both design basis or quick and for maximum credible earthquake and for each of these analysis you have to use seven sets of time histories and you then you average out the result to take uh, to select the result uh, or the forces for the design process dampers need to be compliant to multi axis movement so asc7 warrants that the damping devices shall provide sufficient articulation to accommodate simultaneous longitudinal lateral and vertical displacements of the damping system longitudinal and vertical displacements are complied with by damper stroking however all damper manufacturers do not comply with the provision of lateral damper displacement this provision is complied with if the damper pin connection can articulate a few degrees maybe you know 4 5 6 on either side and still stay function to 100% efficiency so this provision is not much talked of i have not read articles which lay emphasis on why this provision is there in asc 7 but it is a very very important provision and i also would like to uh, tell structural engineers that all damper manufacturers are not meeting this provision so in fact a vast uh, uh, number of damper manufacturers don't meet this articulation lateral art articulation provision of the damper now this is a very important provision in asc 7 which says the maximum and the minimum damper pro uh, properties so uh, to understand this uh, first let us let us understand what a damper is dampers are dampers are mechanical devices right so the, it is a mechanical device that is dissipating energy that works it strokes it yields uh, you know it displaces so it is a mechanical device however when damper properties are being input in softwares like e taps these softwares consider the property and analyze the damper effect by considering it as a definite definitive mathematical equation and matrix so as far as the software is concerned the software is not uh, you know the software takes this mechanical device as a mathematical device with a exact and single definitive solution now it must be you know very clearly understood by structural engineers that they are trying to put a equation uh, representing a damper in their software and then they want a software a damper manufacturer to manufacture a device which exactly meets that equation so the damper manufacturer needs to produce a mechanical device that will meet the software considered mathematical equation as accurately as possible and because it is not in, uh, possible that that exact equation is met asc 7 has something called as lambda max and lambda minimum so lambda max and lambda minimum are the properties that are input into uh, uh, so if you are using a fluid viscous damper The, what is the property you, that you are inputting? Coefficient of damping. If you are using the friction damper, what is the property you are inputting? Well, slip load. So this needs to be changed by lambda max and lambda minimum. And lambda max and lambda minimum are uh, are to be agreed for. So they are not that they they are one point two and one point uh, and point eight five. They are to be agreed to depending on. the quality of dampers that you are uh, purchasing however lambda max less than 1.2 and lambda minimum greater than 
zero point eight five, I will not advise. So you can go less than. So if if the, somebody is not producing a very good damper, you know your lambda max may go to one point four or one point six, and if somebody is not producing that good a damping device, his lambda minimum may you know uh, uh, go to possibly point six or point six five or you know even point five. So this needs to be agreed to, and these lambda properties, lambda max and lambda minimum, should also be endorsed in the warranty certificate. Why they need to be endorsed in the warranty certificate is: let us assume ten years there is no earthquake, fifteen years there is no earthquake, but the building owner or the person who is reviewing the design of a building after fifteen years. Wants to get it checked whether the uh, uh, dampers are working in the same way as they were envisaged to when the building was constructed. So the he will check the the ideal the deviation from the ideal and the deviation from the ideal needs to be between the lambda max and lambda minimum. Okay, so uh, we have already spoken about seven sets of time histories for DB and for MC. damping system redundancy this is a extremely extremely important clause over and above the lambda deviation factor of damper properties asc7 has uh, another mandatory safety feature embedded which says that if you are using less than 8 dampers per story which means four dampers you know on in each direction and uh, you know uh, uh, many buildings don't don't use eight dampers per story so in such kind of situation asc7 warrants that the friction dampers so if you using friction dampers in addition to the lambda max and lambda minimum should be capable of sustaining displacements equal to 130% of the maximum calculated displacements of the device right and uh, a fluid viscous damper should be able to sustain 130% of the velocities of mc which means that if you are not using enough number of dampers per story in a building then you further need to enhance over and above the lambda max and lambda minimum you further need to enhance it by 130% and see that your dampers stay functional effect of infill panel walls on damper properties a very important clause if buildings are having infill panel walls which may be brick block work hollow blocks then these will affect the damper stroke because these are adding some stiffness uh, to the structure it is mandatory to include the stiffness of the infill panel walls while undertaking damper design analysis structural designers can experiment by undertaking both types of damper analysis with and without the infill panel walls and they will be able to see and infer that the damper properties might vary in both these cases uh i've i've just you know use two examples here the first is a velocity dependent device which is a fluid viscous damper and we have used lambda max as 1.15 and lambda minimum as 0.85 and the damper force equation f is equal to cv to the power alpha where coefficient of damping is 1000 kelvin to the second per meter alpha is 0.3 the nrs results will prove that for a damper force capacity as 750 so let's say your etabs is giving you a damper force capacity of 750 kN however after incorporating the modification of lambda factor the damping system redundancy clause and the damper force capacity becomes 945 kN which is so so you you see this once i use the lambda max and i use further 30% enhancement over the lambda max my force of 7 Forty because of the added uh, clauses of ASC seven becomes nine forty five, which is uh, which is twenty five percent over and above the force capacity of MC uh, that is a seven fifty kilonewton. So structural engineers should note that structural members should be designed for the additional forces that are induced in the building as as a result of these higher force capacities dampers. For fluid viscous damper, it may not it may or may not be uh, may not affect the damper response as the damper response is out of phase of the building stresses 
But why I've tried to show this example is even if ETABS is giving you a 75 ton, ton damper, you, because of the additional clauses, you have still used a 100 ton damper. And even after, when you have used the 100 ton damper, you have to check if this 100 ton damper is, is uh, inputting additional forces, inducing additional forces on your structural members. If it is, then you have to design your those structural members that are getting extra forces for, for these induced force, damper forces. Now, in case of fluid viscous damper, because it's out of phase of building stresses, so this it, it may not make a difference uh, because uh, it, it may not add additional forces to the building. However, let's imagine that you're using a displacement dependent uh, you know, friction device like a friction damper. And let's assume that again, you know, for same comp for comparison, I'm use lambda max and lambda minimum as the same example I used above. However, that will not be the case as I have told you in point number 11, that you will have to decide and uh, on the lambda max and lambda minimum and also have it as a, uh, uh, has, have those values endorsed in the warranty certificate. So lambda max for a displacement de de dependent device will be much higher than 1.15 and lambda minimum will be much lower than 0 0.85. However, for to, as a comparison of the above example, I have used the same lambda values. Now the damper slip load, uh, which is also called the yield strength of friction damper, let's assume the nominal value is 1000 kilonewton. Using a lambda factor, the slip load will get enhanced to 1150 kilonewton, which is 15% over and above this. And <clears throat> this further gets enhanced by 30% by the redundancy clause. So we achieve 14, uh, 1495 kilonewton. Now this is up approximately 50% over the nominal value. Now the associated forces on the structure, when the slip load is 1495 kilonewton, you will have to uh, uh, design your structural elements for that additional forces induced by the damper onto your structure. Okay. So now we go and we, we will see that how do we do damper design in ETAPS. <clears throat> Step zero, I am assuming that you already have a damp ETAPS model with you. You already have a you know, building model with you. And now you need to design a damping system in this building. right? The step one is to def define the target response spectrum. So the target response spectrum have to be two. One is the MC and one is the DB. So what I have done is for convenience of uh, structural engineers attending this webinar, whatever you are supposed to do, I have actually check, uh, highlighted those check boxes in red color so that when you receive this manual, it will be much easier for you to follow. So you choose the function, say add a new function. You choose, you, I, I here I've given it the name of MC target target spectra uh, and 5% damp structure. Uh, I've chosen the zone over here. Uh, we'll come back to this three uh, soil type and the response reduction factor, if you see over here is one, right? Now, why is the importance factor three? The importance factor has got nothing, uh, nothing to do with the importance of the building. Why? Uh, uh, so this is a, MC uh, response spectra. And we know that in Indian code, uh, to convert DB into MC, we have a factor of two. So I could have put two over here, but I have put three. Why have I put three? Because in addition to converting DB to MC, if you, if you see our, the Indian code has a load case, earthquake load case, and the factor for the earthquake in the earthquake load case is 1.5. Now this 1.5, if I neglect it, I will never arrive at the maximum earthquake forces induced in the build, in the damper. So which is the intent of ASC 7 as we discussed the, in the clauses earlier. So I have to under account for this load factor because in all other codes, the load factor for earthquake is unity is one, but in Indian code, 
the the uh, uh, because it is one point five. So I so I have used two into one point five, and I have converted because ETABS gives me the response vector for DB and not MC. So I have used two to convert it to MC and used one point five further to uh, target the one point five load case earthquake load case factor, and I get a response spectrum. Uh, which is something like this. I say okay. Similarly, I am putting as the design basis spectrum. However, in this case, I am not converting it into MC by using the factor of two. I am just using one point five. This one point five has got nothing to do with the importance of the building uh, over here. In when you are doing performance based design, you do not consider importance factor because you are explicitly tar uh, evaluating the performance. So you don't have to use 1.2 or 1.5, which is given because those are implicit uh, uh, factors. Uh, in in our case, we'll be explicitly evaluating the performance of the building. So over here, I'm, I've just used the 1.5, which is the load case factor. So I have defined my uh, uh, target response spectrums DB and MC. My step two is to import time histories. In e tabs. Now, before I import the time histories into e tabs, these six files, all of you, you'll, you will be getting from your from the organizers of the uh, webinar. So you open you open a uh, uh, one of these files in in Word uh, in a notepad, and then you uh, what you see over here is a format like this. It's a time and a function. So the first line says time and function, and then Below time, I get uh, you know the time, and in the function, these are acceleration functions. So I'm getting an acceleration function over here. Now, what I need to note from the time step is what is the time step. So if I see between any two points, if I see the time step, it is 0 0.02 seconds. Uh, 0.02 seconds. So that is my time step. Now I copy. Um, this the, the all the uh, I say control all I copy this and paste it into uh, Excel and I get the number of points that exist in this wor uh, uh, word file text sorry text file and there are approximately 21 uh, 2183 points over here like like I have shown you so I I I make a note of the time step and I make a note of number of uh, points that the that the document that, that the text file is having. Now, next next I come to define functions time history, and I have to import these time histories. So I choose from file add new function. I press OK. I give it a name over here. I've given the name of acceleration time history one. I browse to the required time history. Now header line to skip because it was showing time and function. So one line is to be skipped. Then no prefix. So this is zero. The number of points per line is one. It is a free format time and function. So moment I choose this, I get my time history imported into ETABS. Now ETABS has something called as convert to user defined. And moment you press this button, the time history gets embedded within the uh, ETAB. So every time it does not have to reference that text file. So this is a very good function to use. You must use it. This is what the, the window will look like and you say, okay. So you import all the six time histories, right? But these time histories, we don't know that, that whether they are compatible to DB, MC, they are much uh, lower or much higher. So now what we need to do is we need to convert these six time histories now we will have to do analysis both for DB and for MC. So we need to convert these time histories into DB time histories and MC time histories. So what do we do? <clears throat> function time history and we choose match to response spectra. Add new function. Okay. So we, we use a function called match to response spectra. A window like this open. I give it a name. So first I have chosen a DB time history. So I give it a name DB time history one. Uh, spectral matching frequency domain. Now, this is the target response spectra. So I choose the DB spectra over here. I have choose the acceleration time history one file and I press match time history. So moment I press match time history, this was my blue was my original. 
and this is my spectrum matched db time history and i say convert to user defined again my time history gets embedded in the etabs model i say okay i need to do this for all uh, for the db and similarly i do this for mc so i get my time histories imported db and mc time histories imported my next uh, 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 step is to define a damper property so i choose section provide uh, properties link elements and add new property so when i say add new property something like this opens up i give it a name over here i've just given it a name called fluid viscous damper 1 over here i choose damper exponential now this is the local axis of the damper so u1 which is along the damper length and i choose a non linear damper and i press modify and say okay so uh now before i input values over there i need to uh, i i need to open a excel file which which again you will be supplied i choose the my damper capacity over here so over here it's uh, you know 440 kips damper which is approximately about 2000 kN newton damper velocity exponent i have chosen 0.3 0.3 in most cases will give you the best results in some cases you know i have also used 0.4 and 0.5 as the velocity exponent but you can say 90% of the projects 0.3 should give you the best ideal results now this this is something you know which is very interesting uh, the minimum velocity you should always keep as about 5 cm uh, you, you know per second which is about 0.05 meters per second the maximum velocity is the, you know zero i have chosen here 0.4 it may be applicable for a building you know about 10 15 stories high uh, you can you can choose so if the building is higher you know you can choose probably a figure uh, you know something like 0.25 meter per second because the the relative velocity will be will be lower if it's a high rise building now what the this uh, thing uh, what this excel does is it it actually calculates uh, and tell, advises you on you know what Um, no, a value to use so it you know over here it's calculating some value uh, coefficient of damping value for maximum velocity for minimum velocity here it's averaging it out and telling you to use this i have used 2800 over here for the simple reason because i uh, am intending to use 2000 kN dampers in my structure and and this gives me at peak velocity this this gives me near about uh, you know 2000 kN so you know i uh, so that i'm not shooting in the dark the first analysis value i'm using c as 2800 so this is the link box that will open so fvd1 the this stiffness property because i'm i i told you i'm using a 2000 kN damper so you see against 2000 kN damper there's a stiffness value mentioned over here you input that stiffness value over here the damping value from the excel sheet we have chosen 2800 damping exponent we have chosen 0.3 and we say okay and my uh, 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 damper gets damper gets defined now i need to draw this damper into uh, uh, into my etabs model and and this is a extremely simple process you say draw links and you choose the link and you just join the points where you want to so this these red thing, uh, red squares are showing you the points which are joined and that your damper gets defined in the structure so this is the complete Uh, uh, one of the one of the uh, uh, elevations where dampers have been configured and this is how they have been configured uh, just to show you example the, then comes a very interesting part where we actually define the time history load cases so what you go to define load cases and a file like this is going to open up and you say add new case once you say add new case you give it a name over here i'm giving non linear mce time history 1 in time history i told we spoke about fna fast non linear analysis i choose fna and i choose acceleration as the load type for both one is u1 direction the other is u2 direction now in function we have because this is the mce load case uh, so in function time is mce time history 1 and mce time history 2 please do not use the same time history in both the functions it is going to give you very uh, exaggerated and false results so the, the the two time histories in the two directions need to be different 
And this is a scale factor. So the, there's a simple scale factor, 9810. This depends on, depend, uh, on what units are there in, in your uh, ETABS model. Sometimes it will be 9.81, other, other times and using MM when acceleration is being shown in, in um, uh, you know, uh, uh, mm square per second, then, then it's going to be 9810. Now, the next, if you re recollect, you know, if you recollect uh, when I told you how many points my text file had, so it was 2183, so I've input 2180 as the number of time history steps, and my uh, uh, time step was 0 0.02 seconds, which I have input over here. Now, this is the the damping now this is a uh, the, as per the asc7 provisions the internal uh, integral damping cannot be more than three percent so instead of five percent that we've been using for conventional design we say we uh, click on modify and we put this at 0 0.03 we say okay so this is how you define your mc load cases you and your db load cases so similarly you will also define your db load cases so this is that 3% damping that I, I just spoke to you about. This is 2180 uh, uh, points, and this is the time step, which is 0 0.02 second. <clears throat> now, uh, step seven is that you will run your ana analysis. And like I told you, it's an iterative process. You will be running it for at least uh, six to eight times before you kind, kind of configure your dampers. But after each run, the structural engineer is supposed to do some definitive steps. So what are those steps? Let's go through those steps that the structural engineer needs to uh, see if his analysis is run properly or the, he needs to change something drastically. So the first thing is display cumulative energy components, right? Something like this opens up. Over here, you need to choose either your non-linear DB load case or you need to choose non-linear MC load case. Once you choose that, then your graphs will open up over here, something like this. So you see the analysis that has been, demo analysis that's been done. I have opened up over here and it says that the non-linear viscous damping is about 70% and the uh, energy that's getting transferred into the structure is about 30% and we are seeing this for a DB load condition. Similarly, over here, I can change it to MC. And over here, I see my global damping uh, at the structure, 40% energy is going into the structure and 60% energy is being absorbed by the dampers. So you can do this process. These are good results. You know that, okay, my dampers are working fine. The second thing you, are, you need to observe is display quick history links. So moment you click on this links, a table like this is going to open up. Over here, you choose either MC uh, load case or DB load case. The E tabs numbers the uh, dampers from K1 onwards, to however, how, how many number of dampers you have. You can change the dampers, you know, by choosing K1, K2, K3, and similar. The graph, this is the hysteresis loop of the damper, which gives you, this gives you the peak force and this gives you the peak displacement. However, I like to remind such engineers over here that you still, this, this is the, for the nominal values and you will have to incorporate lambda max, lambda minimum, and also the redundancy factor of 130% enhancement before you actually select the dampers for the project. It, they can be food viscous dampers or they can be friction dampers. The, the manual, uh, the clause manual covers both kinds of dampers. Okay, and the last thing, but the most important thing that a, a, a structural engineer needs to re, uh, needs to verify after every time history run is the floor acceleration. So how do you do that? A display, show tables, and you choose the diaphragm accelerations. However, floor accelerations are always and always uh, benchmarked against design basis earthquake. So when I'm choosing the load cases, I choose the six load cases of design basis earthquake and I press OK. So this takes me to, to a table and over here, I see my story uh, and I see what are the uh, accelerations in X direction and in Y direction. So 
in x direction is about 0.15 g and y direction is 0.14 g but i need to still take the resultant of both this so i need to calculate the resultant by by using a square root of sum of squares and that will give me the floor acceleration value of on my particular floor uh, just to give so no code presently is giving any definitive value however as a guidance to structural engineers you need to restrict your floor accelerations for design basis earthquake to less than 0.2 g if you can do that you will have negligible non structural damage and a zero structural damage uh, this is uh, uh, you know i i've just put a table over here showing the various capacities of dampers we chose the dampers that we incorporated in the structure model structure was 2000 kN similarly you can choose you know something higher or you can choose something lower generally in buildings you will use 1000 kN 1500 kN and 2000 kN dampers that is the general trend that i have seen in buildings okay so let's now quickly uh, i how much time do i have i think i have about maybe about 15 odd minutes more so i am going to quickly run through my presentation i will run through certain slides little quicker so uh, so uh, uh, but structural engineers don't mind that it's because of the paucity of time and there's a very interesting lecture by by uh, urjan on base isolation after me so i don't want to and eat up into his time so i very quickly run through my balance slides so this is a damper used in a building existing building to eliminate the soft story action these are dampers used used to improve the seismic performance of a building to immediate occupancy this is a seismic retrofit project this is to control the floor accelerations in a building having long floors a uh, long floor uh, floor spans this is a retrofit building uh, you know building has been retrofitted to upgrade to the latest building code so you can see how the plates are embedded with bolts and the damper is fitted this is a office building is using dampers to uh, to uh, achieve immediate occupancy standard higher rentals higher confidence of the building owners higher uh, confidence of the tenants uh quickly we'll go through a case study the existing building it's called the new udan bhavan delhi airport gmr headquarters is there it's right the square block in, uh, in 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 the in the middle uh to undertake so uh, we took a, a analysis in um, uh, etabs to upgrade the building to immediate occupancy uh before we uh, uh, go on let us see the definition of immediate occupancy post earthquake damage state in which very limited structural damage has occurred the basic vertical and lateral force resistance system the building retain almost all of the pre pre earthquake strength and stiffness the risk of life threatening injury as a result of structural damage is very low and although some minor structural repairs might be appropriate these repairs would generally not be required before reoccupancy however so the building was in collapse prevention state we upgraded it to immediate occupancy state the what is collapse prevention the post earthquake damage state in which the, the structure has uh, components damaged to an extent that no margin against collapse is left but it will continue to support gravity loads the building is on the verge of partial or total collapse substantial damage to the structure has occurred potentially including significant degradation in stiffness and strength of lateral force resistance system large permanent and lateral deformation to the structure so over here you see it's very easy this example will show you it's very easy to upgrade a building from collapse prevention to immediate occupancy now what what when we went for this project what are the challenges we face the client told us that the building that you are going to upgrade needs to be operational at all times it will not be closed down the building will not be vacated least disruption to the interiors because doing up the interiors again would have added a lot of cost to it no disruption of office working quality standard is only 100% acceptable maintain timelines at all stages and it should also be the least cost when compared to all other technologies including the conventional technology of using fiber wrap or jacketing of beams and columns and so these this was the criteria laid down on to us and we produced an analytical model of the building we we put dampers on various floors we chose the seismic hazard 
like we have gone through the example, I've showed it to you. Um, like I mentioned, each load case will have two components, X and Y, and both need to be different. Uh, energy loops of the damper, I have shown you in the example. This is the energy loops that we obtained for this particular building. Uh, over here, you see uh, th this, is, this is the MC level event, and we absorbed about 60-65% of the seismic energy. Uh, how, did, how did we perform to drift and base shear? So the drifts, uh, you know, we, we kept the drifts to under control of less than 0.8%, which was much below the 1% that was desired for major occupancy. So the drift control that we achieved in both X and Y direction in all flows was tremendous. We also achieved a reduction of about 25% in the base shear of the building. Uh, the front elevations, the how we fix the dampers, this is the front elevation, uh, but this has got certain facade elements where you can't see the complete dampers. Uh, this is the, the, the image below shows you how the dampers were fixed, you know, so, so which is the beam column joint where the dampers were fixed. Uh, similarly, the rear elevation, the side elevation, and the right side elevation. Uh, once the dampers were uh, configured, the these were produced and they were tested they were tested in front of the client all of the testing is automated the moment the you know the test bed uh, the, uh, uh, the damper starts functioning automated graphs and results keep coming out and get printed and the result is everything is an automated process and these results stay for life which basically means if you recollect what i told you right in the beginning uh, these dampers, you know, even if they are tested after, let's say, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 30 years, maybe even 40 years, should produce the same graph and same performance that it produced when it was new. And that is why I mentioned to structural engineers uh, when I explained lambda max and lambda minimum that you must have these factors inbuilt in the warranty. That means it is not lambda max, lambda minimum is not only a factor having technical significance it also is a factor that has significant financial and legal uh, uh, usage because if if the damper performance goes beyond this lambda max and lambda minimum you know there would be legal provisions which the building owner may like to comply to okay these are the these are the installed images of how the dampers were installed and they looked after installation. Dampers can be installed in, in, in many ways. I have tried to pictorially show them. So these are, you know, instead of steel braces, you are using, you are using a concrete brace. So, uh, so you know, the damper is attached uh, to a column over here. They're attached to a brace, but this brace is not connected to the top beam. And so th this is like a uh, this is like a free freestanding RCC wall, which is which is doing work of a concrete brace instead of a steel brace. Uh, this is again dampers being installed within the uh, shear wall. So you see that the, the left end is attached to the wall, the right end is attached to the uh, brace, and this this brace is not actually sorry. Uh, this brace is actually not connected uh, to the sides, so it is free to move. So that the damper can stroke. Uh, you can have in chevron brace. Now, very important thing, and which this slide will tell you is that fluid viscous dampers, uh, you know, are unlike any other dampers, which may be metal yield dampers, whether it may be a BRB, it may be a friction damp, uh, damper, which needs to be continuous from foundation right up to the roof because they are rigid elements. They are elements just like your shear wall. So you you can't have shear wall in a few floors and uh, you know missing in the other floors. So shear wall needs to be continuous from the foundation to the roof. So similarly, the other dampers, whether it's friction, whether it's a BRB brace, whether it's a metal yield damper, needs to be continuous from the roof to the foundation. However, that's not the case with fluid viscous dampers. You can pick and choose the locations where you want to uh, install your damper, and they may not be continuous from uh, you know the foundation all the way up. So you can pick and choose the base where you want to put them. They may end abrupt, abruptly at what a particular floor because you have achieved your performance. 
So you, you may skip floors in between, you know, it's up to you. So diff different ways, these are normal diagonal dampers installed, these are chevron brace. This is an inverted chevron brace. These are again, uh, concrete brace uh, dampers attached, attached to the bay. So let's, let's very quickly go through an uh, 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 example. The dampers arrive on site. These braces get manufactured. The, these are the braces that will accommodate the dampers. They get manufactured in a steel fabrication facility. That means they get manufactured in a factory and they are transported to site. Uh, on site, the, the uh, vertical bars are embedded because over here, the intention is to use a concrete brace so vertical, vertical bars are embedded using, using chemical anchors. Uh, the, the horizontal reinforcement is, is fixed on them. So the cage is prepared. Uh, the damper brace is, uh, uh, the, the damper bracket is erected uh, to stay in place. The formwork is put and concrete is poured. Once concrete is poured, after the normal curing time, it is removed and we have a concrete brace and the damper. Now, I, I love showing this photograph. And the, and the reason why I show this photograph is that to, un, to make people understand that fluid viscous dampers were velocity dependent and not displacement dependent. So you see, this is a very, very rigid element, uh, rigid portion of a building. And still the structural engineer has been, has put a damper here to absorb the energy. So, so because they were, uh, even if the displacements are very low, uh, 2 mm, 3 mm, 1 mm, 5 mm, the dampers will still work. So I have finished. I think I'm just in time. It's, it's, going to, it's a minute or two minutes to 5.30. And I hand over the floor back to the organizing committee. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for a short but elaborate session. I'll now request uh, Tanuja ma'am to please start with question answer session. Yes. Mm. Tanuja ma'am, so, we can have two or three questions now, yeah. and other question can be taken at the end. Correct. But, correct. Uh, right. Please, go ahead. Uh, so, the question is uh, how does dampers help to structural system? in seismic events compared to base isolation and which one is efficient for the same? Okay, so both, uh, both systems work uh, very, very efficiently in earthquakes. Both our uh, systems are very, very widely adopted around the world. Uh, the, difference, the difference between the two is that base isolation, uh, it, it, uh, at the isolation level, uh, and I, I'm not going to dwell on what uh, Mr. Urjan is going to say because he's he's going to cover base isolation in great detail. But but all the uh, the the uh, the isolation plane, so all the displacements are restricted to the isolation plane. So the kind of uh, uh, you know the the uh, seismic uh, forces are not are not allowed to uh, travel above the isolation plane. However. Whereas uh, in, in, the, in the case of uh, dampers, fluid viscous dampers, the fluid viscous dampers uh, absorb energy from any place which has got relative velocity between the two ends. So any two points which has a relative velocity between them in a seismic event or a wind event, you can put dampers and absorb, because they are velocity dependent, you can absorb energy. So the moment you start absorbing energy from a system, you start giving it benefit in terms of structural response. Okay, that's great. So next question is from uh, Mr. Raju once again, uh, that what are the base de basic design parameters for design capacity of dampers and performance of dampers? So uh, like I have um, covered in my presentation, um, you would like to look at drifts, uh, uh, drift control, uh, you, you know, you may like to keep the drifts under 1% or you may like to keep, uh, you know, uh, the drifts under 0.8%, like I, I want to, uh, like I prefer to keep, uh, you know, which is a much more stringent provision, even when I compare it to 
uh, uh, ASC7. So uh, floor exfoliations, I would love to have them below 0.2 G because that gives me not only protection to the structural elements, but also to the non-structural elements. Uh, and, and I, you know, if you're adding, if you're using dampers, the owners of the building should get that added uh, advantage. As far as base shear is concerned, I will definitely target a you know, reduction of about 20-25% in the base share of the building. I think uh, probably his question uh, may be that how to decide exactly the damper force for okay. a given link. Okay, so, so uh, you see, uh, again, it depends on your structure and uh, it will come to the structural engineers after some experience in designing dampers. But if, let us assume, you have a structure, the column size is you know, 800 by 800 or 900 by 900. It's a it's a modern building. You have followed ductile detailing, or it's a new building. You know, a, a column of this size can easily take a 2,000 kilonewton damper. So you know, you should try and use 2,000 kilonewton dampers because the uh, columns of of this size will be easily be able to accommodate that kind of movement. But let's say it's an existing building. You're looking at a column which you know is is uh, let's say 600 mm by 600 mm or maybe 450 mm by 600 mm and ductile detailing is also a suspect you will try and you know go for a damper which is not more than 750 kilonewton or at best 1000 kilonewton so the, it, you need I to understand what your structure can take yeah, and yeah. and and then you need to plan your dampers then you need to input those values in the excel sheet that i have given you then you need to do your analysis then you need to see what your analysis is giving you may you may uh, feel that okay my analysis should give me 750 kilonewton but then you know when you run your analysis it is giving you either more or less so if it is giving you more then you need to reduce the coefficient of damping if it is giving you less then you need to increase the coefficient of damping so you will need to do that's why i mentioned it's an iterative process and you will need to run the analysis six to eight times before you configure your damping system uh, what I get, uh, what I got from your answer is that if the column size is large enough to take the uh, higher damper force. Yes, that's right. That's right. Okay. Uh, there is a next question. Uh, uh, when we model the infill wall as compression strut in ETAB model, can we model dampers at the same location in ETABs? Yes, you you can model the uh, uh, so. Uh, uh, Modeling a strut uh, uh, or adding stiffness to your ETABS model does not prohibit you from uh, from uh, modeling a damper at that location. However, uh, uh, like I mentioned, uh, 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 like I like I mentioned uh, to you, the stroking of the damper will get affected if you are modeling the infill panel walls, and that is why if your building is having infill panel walls. Uh, uh, you know, it is uh, uh, it is very important that uh, uh, you model them in ETABS to get the true uh, picture of damper stroking in an actual earthquake. There's uh, 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 a comment from uh, Mr. Yusuf, and he he wants to briefly speak about metal bellow dampers. So, uh, uh, Yusuf, if you can unmute, and I just saw your comment. So, uh, would you like to speak about the metal bellow damper? No, I just uh, want to, to remind you that it would be very effective if you little bit talk about metal below damper, which controls wind effect for the whole, whole building. Yes. So I, uh, if you, uh, very, very valid and a good point, uh, Yusuf. Um, if you recollect my presentation, I showed you one, um, a 181 Fremont building. And I mentioned to you that these dampers uh, function under both wind and uh, uh, seismic. So these are very special kind of dampers. They are called as metal bellows. Now metal bellows are dampers which are guaranteed for infinite cycles. So what a metal damper, uh, metal bellow does is it, once you fix it in the building, it starts working and it never stops working. So building is 10 years old, 20 years old, 30 years old, 50 years old, 60 years old. The damper never stops to work. So what this uh, uh, metal bellow uh, damper does is uh, it, uh, uh, you know, for wind sensitive structures that that uh, uh, Yusuf just pointed out, you know, they, they are going to have some movement in millimeters or in, in centimeters throughout their life. 
and the metal damp metal bellow dampers are used there for continuous stroking um, continuous stroking but these are very special kind of dampers uh, uh, used on uh, mainly uh, you know wind sensitive structures uh, which are going to have uh, you know some uh, some movement and because you want to keep the floor accelerations below a particular point so that you know the the occupants don't feel uh, restless uh, feel nausea uh, so th that is where the, the wind dampers uh, uh, the metal bellow dampers come into play uh, uh, mr shaha i think uh, uh, the question was pertaining to the modeling uh, that uh, at the same location can we give two two links because we are going to model the compression strut as a link only and then we are giving uh, uh, the damper also the as a link yeah so can we have them at the same location yeah. that was the probably the question uh, that that uh, he wanted to ask yeah uh, miss miss i already answered that question and then i went on to metal bellows so i said yes you uh, uh, giving a stiffness element which is which is the infill panel wall it does not affect uh, uh, at all, uh, you know, giving you defining a damper exponential. So you are okay. you are you are uh, a fluid viscous damper is called damper exponential in e tabs. So okay. uh, so uh, you, you know it's a different model, a different mathematical model itself. Uh, okay. So so as far as e tabs is concerned, you can define both of them. Okay. Okay. And uh, I think last question I'll take for this uh, session. Uh, how to get expected uh, damper force? For example, uh, uh, if I want to use FVD for a building, uh, so to design FVDs, how to calculate expected damper force? So, so the, I, uh, as you have probably answered this question, it's a trial and error procedure. Yes. And depending upon the column size, you have to fix the damper force. Uh, that, is right right? Uh, uh, th that is right. That is right. But uh, I, I am giving an Excel sheet which will give you the first, you know, uh, uh, the first input value of coefficient of damping. However, uh, uh, you know, in the in, uh, in the ETABS manual, when I went through the ETABS manual, I showed the hysteresis loops. And in the hysteresis loops, I pointed two arrows uh, showing the maximum uh, and minimum damper force. So that is that along with the provisions of ASC 7, the, which are the enhancement provisions. Uh, that you're going to use to configure your damper size. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. So I think uh, uh, we will stop at this point because there are few questions, but they are with respect to isolation, isolators. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So, and ma'am. Now, moving on to our next second technical session, I would like to introduce our second speaker of the day, Mr. Ujjan. So let's welcome Mr. Urjan, who has completed his bachelor's degree in civil engineering at Metun 2012. In 2014, he has graduated from MEEES, having a structural earthquake engineer master's degree from Metu and IUSS Peria. He is still continuing his advanced studies in Metu as PhD candidate in seismic base isolation. Mr. Urjan has been working in PIS which is the only company in Turkey and one of the few in the world that provides turnkey services in friction pendulum type based isolation device supply. Being in the company from the beginning, he has experienced technology, design, certification, and application aspects of the industry thoroughly. Mr. Urjan is an active board member in the Turkish Association of Seismic Isolation and a member of SEC. 
He is actively participating in the technical boards of standard committees of EN 151292. So I welcome Mr. Ujjan and would request him to please start with your session. Thank you. Thank you for the kind presentation. Uh, and I also thank Mr. Sandeep Shah for his uh, great presentation. It was uh, quite full. I hope that I can, I can uh, match his standards, actually. Now I think I should be able to share my screen. Okay, uh, so today I will start with the main concept of base isolation uh, and some application examples to just to, to, to uh, introduce the idea behind base isolation. Then I will focus on pendulum type base isolation devices since uh, our expertise lies on that topic. Uh, I will give some details on general technical properties of pendulum isolators, then I will uh, mention design properties, then I will briefly go over structural analysis sections with modeling parameters and then the performance verification parts. Uh, so I'm sure most of you are already familiar with the concept of performance-based earthquake engineering, even if uh, it is either it is stated in the codes uh, in words or not, we always use performance-based earthquake engineering in any structural design. It depends on the code you use, it depends on the performance target you consider, but we all use uh, this methodology. Uh, so performance-based earthquake engineering simply utilizes different uh, seismic levels depending on the damage, the possible damage on a structure. So for example, uh, you may want to, you, you may be a owner of the structure and you may want to have a certain performance target for a certain level of earthquake. For example, you can say that uh, I don't want any damage in, in my building after a very strong earthquake. Or you can even say, uh, OK, I can expect some damage, but it depends on these this, this conditions. But in any case, in most of the seismic codes, the international seismic codes, let's say, the, these performance levels are well defined. Uh, and in almost all of them, if you consider the minimum requirements of that seismic design code, you will, in, in best condition, you will have life safety performance. So after a strong ground shaking, after a strong earthquake, you, you will have, you will experience some damage in your building, in your structure, it's, it's, uh, it's for sure. It is, it is the main design principle that we start at the, in the first place. Uh, so that, damage consideration or that damage level may, may not be satisfactory for some structures, for some, let's say, special structures, like power plants or data centers or hospitals or bridges, some buildings like that, some structures like that. So here comes the base isolation and actually uh, external energy dissipators like uh, dampers into, into the equation. I will obviously focus on the base isolation part. Uh, it is, the logic of base isolation is quite simple. We just put some special devices underneath the structure between the foundation of the uh, isolated structure and the structure itself. So when the earthquake hits compared to the fixed based example, fi the fixed based structure, the earthquake effects are mostly carried by the special base isolation devices so that the superstructure uh, isolated building uh, is protected from all effects of earthquakes. So <clears throat> it is one of the recent technologies in, in earthquake engineering. So uh, maybe I can give a little bit more detail. Uh, the base isolation devices 
are quite stiff in vertical direction, but has a very low stiffness in lateral directions. This allows uh, almost uninterrupted or free movement of the of these devices or base isolation system during an earthquake or during the ground shaking so that the superstructure can behave like a rigid body. Uh, so after any strong ground motion, the superstructure can remain intact and both the uh, floor accelerations and interstellar drifts can be kept at, at a certain level. So uh, the entire structure can be protected all at once with all structural and non-structural components or any equipment that is uh, fragile inside. Uh, so if, if we have to compare fixed base and base isolated structures, in fixed base structure, all the post-elastic deformation occurs on the structure itself. So you will have some structural and definitely non-structural damage. Uh, in the base isolated case, all the post-elastic deformation is focused or carried by base isolation devices so that the superstructure can remain elastic. I will mention it, but that is why actually we can use uh, FNA in nonlinear analysis because the superstructure is already expected to be linear. So you don't need to model it nonlinearly. Uh, <clears throat> the, the additional positive impact of base isolation devices is about the uh, damping, actually. Since these are, uh, let's say, machinery that, that can impose higher hysteretic damping on the, on the structure, this also prevents further effect or this allows us to have uh, more energy dissipation during an earthquake motion. So that is the secondary additional uh, positive impact of base isolation devices. Uh, here I share, uh, I believe it summarizes all the aspects of base isolation. Uh, it is directly taken from FEMA catalog uh, and I directly share it here. So if, let's say we consider the design earthquake. It is, it is stated as major earthquake in this uh, slide. Uh, and it is usually represented as design basis earthquake in most of the seismic codes. So let's, let's take this earthquake level and we use basic code requirements, which is the minimum that you have to apply to, to have a consistent design according to the current uh, earthquake design codes. If you apply that code, and if the, uh, considering the fact that all the construction made perfectly fine according to that uh, specifications, if that building is struck by the earthquake that is designed for, then you will have some damage and you will have some uh, repairing to do it. It has both uh, it will definitely have some structural damage and it will have a lot of non-structural damage for sure. And that building will not be, we may or may not be operational for some time after that earthquake. So uh, just skipping to the top part, if we use base isolated, then of course it is cost analysis, but uh, after, after that earthquake, you may or may not, or you may uh, have maybe a couple of hours of downtime, but other than that, you should be able to uh, keep using your building uh, without any disruption, if everything was, of course, applied correctly. I'm, I'm not only talking about structural protection, it is all structural, non-structural, and all the equipments inside. So just a simple shake table test from, I think, beginning of, uh, end of 1990s. In the first one, uh, they make the test with the base isolation devices active.
and then they just simply put some uh, plates on near the base isolation devices to to fix fix it. So it is a fixed base right now. As as you can see, the non-structural elements or infill walls just uh, failed, so they stopped the the test. And I have another video that is that will be showing basically the pendulum devices, but a simple simulation that that's how, how it can be applied. That is the main uh, working principle actually. It is it based on the sliding systems. Obviously, they are put on each column underneath the structure uh, to separate the entire building with the, with the ground. So when the earthquake hits, the, the displacements or the motion occurs only on the base isolation devices so that the upper structure can have a very long period motion uh, or, very, or comfortable uh, motion, let's say. And this is the sliding mechanism during during the earthquake. Uh, so I will uh, skip these parts quickly. I have already mentioned the base isolation can control both interstellar drifts and floor accelerations at the same time, and it is already proven in some real real life cases. Like uh, during the North Northridge earthquake, there are there were isolated and non isolated hospitals, uh, and the effect of isolation can could be clearly seen in that in that uh, earthquake. So. Uh, in in non-isolated ones, the I mean conventional ones, the accelerations are increased to 250 percent of the ground, compared to the accelerations reduced to reduced to one third in the in in the base isolated uh, hospitals. Also, there are many many examples from Japan. Uh, for example. In, in isolated and non-isolated fixed based and isolated building comparison, the difference of field uh, or measured accelerations are at least three times from each other and maybe up to six, seven, ten times. So it creates huge difference. Uh, and in in the isolated buildings, the comfort level of the residents are incredibly high. They they, they don't even feel the strong ground motion while the fixed based uh, buildings almost collapse so it is it is uh, the dead comfort level is something else for if you consider the psychology of people of obviously so main scope of applications are mostly in in, in the entire world it is the case actually mostly it starts with hospitals and uh, then continues with bridge and viaducts. Then data centers, maybe historical heritage, the cultural heritage places. Uh, then maybe followed by data centers or special uh, storage tanks, storage buildings. Then it goes to museums, malls, houses, the residential areas also. But to be honest, it is. I mean, the houses, how the usage of base isolation in residential areas uh, is only uh, done or is only valid in Japan. Other, in, in other places, it is not at that level at the moment. Uh, so there are many, three main types of base isolation devices that is used in the world. It is high damping rubber fairings, uh, lead rubber bearings and uh, friction pendulum devices. I will focus on pendulums, as I mentioned before. Uh, this is one application example from site. As, as can be seen, we put isolators on, on top of the, the 
first story columns for this building and uh, every column will have one isolator. Uh, it can also be, the base isolation can also be applied on existing buildings if that existing building is sufficient or uh, proper enough to, to, to carry this application. There are many factors that affect if that if base isolation can be applied to existing building or not, and it has to be it has to be quite detailed detailed uh, that has to be quite detailed analysis in in many uh, parts of of such a project because the existing buildings are usually not so uh, suitable for base isolation application. There, there are a lot of reasons for that. The, the, the most obvious one is they they were they were built some years ago, and at that time the active or valid seismic code would be quite different from the current one. And even if the, that building was built uh, according to the valid seismic code at the time, it it may not be uh, good for the uh, base isolation. So. That is that is why the, the base isolation application on existing buildings uh, should have to be very detailed. Um, anyway, in the in this slide you can also see that you you may have some elevation differences in the base isolation level if you have some elevator shafts or stairs shafts or some other uh, thing. Uh, you may have some. Uh, elevation differences. It is also okay. It, it it changes slightly the structural analysis and detailing, especially at the connection parts. But uh, this can be applied with proper structural analysis solution and proper modeling. So just quickly go over the uh, go over some apply, applied structures like hospitals, the historical monuments. Uh, data centers, obviously bridges and viaducts. Uh, and again, mentioning the isolated types, I, I have told you there are three mainly used types, high ramping rubber bearing, lead core rubber bearing, and pendulums. Uh, pendulums also have three types inside them, single, double, and triple. Uh, actually, single surface pendulums are have very uh, limited usage uh, right now because the double surface pendulums have um, have proven themselves to be much more economical with the same performance level. So uh, single surface pendulums are mostly obsolete. I, I can clearly say that. Uh, the three types of rubber isolators, the low damping rubber bearings are not actually base isolation devices, so they can be excluded. High damping and lead rubber bearings are widely used in, in the world, especially, for example, for high damping rubber bearings, the usage in Japan is quite high. Uh, and lead rubber bearings are used all over the world. I will focus on pendulums that are um, actually, four main items in, in a double surface pendulum device. Uh, the blue part that you see on the screen is, I mean, the top and bottom plates are main backing plates. They have a specific radius of curvature value that is determined by the design and according to the performance target of the isolated structure. Uh, the gray ones you can see are stainless steel sheets that they are allowing smooth motion during during an earthquake. Uh, the red ones you see are special sliding materials that uh, determines all the characteristics of the motion actually by the by controlling the friction. I will go into details. So the pendulum isolators has vibrational properties of a simple pendulum. Uh, in, in, a, in a vertical simple pendulum, you have a mass, which is the acting axial load on isolation devices. Uh, then you have frictional force and the 
resisting force. So depending on equilibrium of all those forces, you can easily calculate the period, the natural oscillation period of, of one device, one simple device. And you can see that it is independent of the mass on top of it. So because of that independency, uh, the base isolated device, base isolation system that is composed of friction pendulums do not have, do not create any problems of torsion in the upper structure because uh, the oscillation period of base isolation devices are independent of the mass and it only depends on periods of curvature. As long as you keep the same rates of curvature on all devices, you will not have any torsion problem. So that is one of the biggest advantages of actually pendulum devices. Uh, the, um, okay, it can be considered as another advantage. The hysteretic behavior is quite simple and quite realistic. Uh, it almost perfectly matches the perfect bilinear behavior in, in if you consider the hysteresis of uh, a single phase isolation device. Uh, there are some important parameters that can be calculated. Q is the starting point of motion, depending on the horizontal load. By the way, that bilinear behavior is drawn for horizontal load versus horizontal displacement. Uh, and stiffnesses and periods can easily be calculated according to perfect bilinear relationship. Obviously, for pendulum devices, that K1 value, the initial stiffness, is uh, infinity because it, there, there cannot start any motion unless the frictional force is uh, beaten by the uh, horizontal force caused by the earthquake. So that K1 is infinite, but it cannot be modeled as infinite. Obviously, you have to consider some value. So in order to enter a K1 value in your model, it is usually considered that dy is equal to one, one millimeter. So K1 is quite high, but some uh, reasonable value that do not break your software. So um, anyway, after that, the another important parameter is K2, obviously, which is actually only dependent on radius of curvature. Which, because, uh, which is also uh, dependent on the TP, which the oscillation period that I have just mentioned. Uh, so as long as you know K1 and K2, you can draw this relationship. And once you try to start your uh, linear and nonlinear analysis or iterations, you can use these relationships to calculate the displacements. I will, again, explain the, the logic behind it. Uh, there are also some effective parameters. The effective parameters are calculated only for linear analysis, the simple linear analysis. And uh, they can, uh, they are not meaningful actually in, in any nonlinear analysis approach. So, uh, they are simple to calculate, easy to check. But if you want to use, if you want to have make a nonlinear analysis, they they are unrelated, let's say, and um, they they can be just omitted. So if you consider the maximum horizontal force uh, transmitted to superstructure from your base isolated base isolation devices. Uh, you can simply use this bilinear equation you, after you calculate, obviously, the displacement demand. Uh, then K1 is already known, K2 is already known, and you can just reach the maximum force. But how, how do we decide the main design parameters of base isolation devices and any base isolation system? Actually, it starts with the target performance of the structure. 
uh, it is like what what does the owner wants from the structure and what what can be done to achieve it uh, so depending on the site properties which creates acceleration spectra or design spectra and the target performance of the structure uh, the design structural designers reach a position that they can say that okay the maximum base shear that my building can sustain is this much and if that base shear uh, is calculated then the base isolation devices may have this displacement but usually the displacements are not limited if there's a specific limit it is also decided in the first place then only after then the design of individual base isolation devices and the base isolation system can be done in order to do that we simply um, try to achieve that target performance of the structure by arranging frictional and geometrical properties of each each phase isolation device so i will uh, go to analysis parts now and i will start with simple equivalent linear procedure this will also explain what we do but a lot i tried to explain a couple of minutes ago so in order to start designing the base isolation system and base isolation devices, inputs are always the same. Let's say most of the time the same. Uh, the isolator axial loads, design spectra, and performance targets of the isolated structure. They do not change. I mean, the, these parameters obviously changes, but these are what is needed to design the base isolation system. Then, depending on the isolator, Excel loads, the isolation system is it idealized. It is uh, switched to single degree of freedom system, a simple system. To, to make that switch, we have to calculate equivalent friction and effective parameters of that isolation system, which are stiffness, period, and damping. And then we simply perform an iterative single degree of freedom analysis. Equivalent linear procedure is called in most of the uh, seismic curves. For example, uh, what I tried to show you here is a simple project which DB and MC level design spectra are provided. And then in the below table, uh, the performance targets are provided. It is like a starting point of, of any isolation system design. Since we are already given the axial loads on each isolation device, we can simply uh, start designing our devices. The first step is, of course, trying to understand what is the equivalent friction of this base isolation system. In order to do that, we use the axial loads and uh, dimensions of the sliding material we use. Uh, one small note at this point, there's a special relationship between friction coefficient and axial pressure on the sliding materials or axial pressure on, on the base isolation device to, to simplify. Uh, that relationship is most of the time quite confidential and that relationship changes from manufacturer to manufacturer uh, and material to material. That is why this part is usually uh, is not it cannot be known by any, the structural designer. So it is the manufacturer's responsibility to check the axial loads, to distribute the base isolation devices depending on the axial load level, and then reach the target or expected or requested equivalent friction. So in this example, we reach the equivalent friction of 5.3%. And there are some upper bound and lower bound coefficients that needs to be applied to, to, uh, to reduce the risks or to uh, estimate the possible minimum and possible maximum values of the, that friction. Because friction is not constant, it changes with axial load, okay, but it also changes with temperature, it also changes with 
uh, spreading or uh, contamination, uh, heating, heating of the material. So there are many factors that is affecting. And again, that upper bound and lower bound factors are always dependent on uh, different and dependent on each manufacturer. It depends on their test results. It depends on their design principles. So uh, that is another thing that is supplied by the manufacturer and most design codes allow it uh, as long as they can, uh, they can submit also some test results uh, to support their position. So then after we get the target, the target performance of the structure, then we calculate uh, equivalent friction then there's nothing more to start uh, iterative single degree of freedom analysis. That iteration uh, <clears throat> starts with the selection of actually radius of curvature value, which is, which is completely geometrical value. Uh, it also, it is affected by some eccentricity calculations, but they are not there quite detailed at the moment. So, Depending on the equivalent friction and selected radius of curvature, then we can start the iteration. Iteration starts, iteration can start with many parameters. You can start with selecting T effective. You can start with selecting K effective. You can start with selecting displacement. In this example, I have selected displacement as the starting point. Uh, that 0 0.3 on the first row is selected by us. Then we calculate F, K effective, T effective, and damping for that displacement level. And we also introduce a design spectra at this point and damping reduction factors, which are clearly uh, formalized in uh, all of the design codes, actually. I mean, you can easily reach all these uh, equations to, to set up this iteration Excel. Uh, only following the code requirements. After that, we simply calculate a new displacement. So, okay, this in this example, in the first one, they were quite close, but on the bottom one, for example, I, we selected 0 0.3 meters and we calculated 0 0.14 meters as a result. So, Okay, they are not very close, so iteration number two. We start with 0 0.14, we do the same calculations, and we reach 0 0.11. Anyway, after a couple of iterations, let's say at the end of 10, uh, we reach in the end like 0 0.1 meter displacement. And using that displacement value, you can easily calculate the effective period, maximum base shear, and uh, effective stiffness. So this is a simple sing single degree of freedom analysis to initially preliminarily design and confirm that your base isolation system is satisfactory according to your structural targets or requirements. Uh, for most of the projects, this is only the initial check and preliminary control. So then you have to continue with more advanced analysis, which I can recommend only nine minute time response history analysis. Obviously, you may have other alternatives like linear response history analysis or response spectrum analysis, but uh, as long as you have correct tools, why lose time or why bother with these other linear alternatives? Because they will not be as accurate as the full nonlinear response history analysis, anyways. So most of the time, instead of losing time with linear, more linear approaches, equivalent linear procedure can be selected uh, as the only linear solution, then nonlinear analysis can be performed. Obviously, you will need some uh, sophisticated softwares like SAP or ETAPS, uh, but they, they can be uh, easily reachable at this point. Then you have to, I, I all skip the structural 
modeling details at this point, I will directly go into isolated part. Uh, then you have to define some nonlinear links. Some designers also uh, prefer using spring elements, but I personally go with the link. Uh, and you have to define some correct isolated properties inside that links. So in this example here, the link type is selected as friction isolated. There are a lot of selections that you can make at that point. Multilinear plastic may also be selected, but since you are, we are modeling friction pendulums, friction isolator is the most accurate one, actually. Uh, and underneath, you have to define some nonlinear properties on these links. Depending on the, depending on your assumed isolated properties, you have to uh, enter some, for example, stiffness or friction coefficients or and reds of curvatures at this stage. The stiffness mentioned here is the initial stiffness. So it 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 is calculated based on your average service load on the isolators and the yield displacement of the yield displacement assume assumption of one millimeter. So uh, that is not effective stiffness. That is no other stiffness. It is the initial stiffness. So, uh, and this, uh, if you write too high, then your model would not work correctly. If you write too low, then your displacements would not be calculated correctly. So uh, it is rather tricky to, to, to decide on this stiffness value. Uh, for friction coefficients, you will see two different input areas here. One is fast and one is slow. For seismic applications, you care only for fast friction coefficient. Friction coefficient fast means it is the seismic effect. And after, uh, the, after it is affected, if it is uh, used um, for a certain threshold of seismic effect or velocity value. The slow friction coefficient represents a very slow motions during an earthquake and also SARS motions. So uh, even if you write some different values to slow and fast friction coefficients, at the end of analysis, you will see that if you change slow, okay, let's say you write both of them the same, or you write 1% to slow and 5% to fast, you will see almost no difference between the results. So the slow is not really effective in high seismic regions or uh, seismic analysis. But it all it has some minor effects. So it is, it is always good to enter a correct value. Uh, then there is net pendulum radius. It is, the, it is basically equivalent radius of curvature value. And it is a geometrical property that you have already chosen. Uh, so for the U1 direction, which is the vertical direction, you can simply select some high stiffness value, which may depend on uh, vertical compression properties of the sliding material. Or if you, if you want to exaggerate, you can uh, select the steel compressive properties. Uh, then there is the selection of ground motions, obviously, that is highly seismology. That is, a, that is the area of seismology, actually. But if you have to do this yourself, you have to go to peer uh, database, you have to select some ground motions. But I have to tell you, it is not easy to do. Um, it is always my recommendation to have some have the professional opinion of a, a seismologist because the scaling and matching of ground motions to, to the certain design spectrum is not an easy thing to do. And it depends a lot on the frequency contents, on the properties of the selected ground motion. So it is a delicate procedure and it has to be done by seismologists. Um, anyway. After you have your set of ground motions, which uh, has three components, 
x, y, and z directions in uh, as the data, uh, then you can almost start the time history analysis. Before actually applying time, time histories, you have to also define a ramp function to, to, to induce the service loads before starting the actual motion. So it is another trick, but it is quite easy procedure. Then you can simply run your analysis and check the results. For checking the results, you have to uh, you have to check isolated displacements and actually the forces transmitted to the superstructure, which will uh, induce interstellar drifts and floor accelerations. So, if I mean there are more than one ground motions, obviously seven for some. Uh, codes and 11 for some codes. Anyway, you run 11 uh, sets of ground motions, then uh, it again depends on the design, structural design philosophy of you choose, but most of the time the average of that 11 ground motions are considered and you can determine your uh, final uh, drifts, accelerations, uh, displacement depends uh, according to those data. And there is the verification part. In order to verify if you have chosen the correct uh, test, uh, correct isolator or not, there are some tests, prototype tests and production tests. Uh, the prototype tests are main design confirmation or verification, whereas the production tests are only to check if everything is okay with the mass, mass manufacturing. So it is, they are very simple. But prototype tests are quite long and very, very uh, tiring for, for the isolator. You, you, you use different axial load, different velocities, different displacements, and you try to understand all the properties of uh, the designed uh, devices. I will just show you a couple of tests just to, just to give you an opinion. It is, uh, these kind of tests are like 15, 20 of them are performed on one device and the results are evaluated. Another one. For example, in this test, the velocity was one meters per second and displacements were uh, 840 millimeters plus and minus. So at the end, we receive some test reports and which include all the data that is required to evaluate the performance of, of the design devices. For example, in this, in this slide, uh, you can see some bilinear idealization of a device that we design. And uh, with the specified, I mean, this bilinear relationship is obtained for a specific displacement, axial load, friction coefficient, and radius of curvature value, obviously. With that properties, uh, when, when we perform the test, we receive some different uh, plots. Um, and we try to understand if that bilinear assumption or bilinear idealization is satisfactory with the actual prototype device. So in this example, uh, when you check the numbers, you can see that the, um, the test results are almost perfect match with bilinear relationship. That is the advantage I was talking in the first place. So it is quite easy to model and quite easy to predict if in the end, this, uh, these base isolation devices uh, are working properly or not. There is another bar chart on the top right, which shows different values of friction coefficient in different tests. That is mainly depend. That is mainly uh, is the reason of the change of friction coefficient with, with the axial loads of the tests. So in order to estimate the correct 
the uh, the most reasonable relationship between axial load and friction coefficient, we have to the test. We have to perform some tests with different axial loads, so with different velocities, to to understand all the aspects of one uh, device that is designed. So that is why uh, there are different levels of axial loads. There are different levels of velocities, and there the, there are different values as a result of friction coefficient. So that is my conclusion, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I will um, first start, please start with question and answer session. May I start the question and answer session? Yes, ma'am. Uh, so the question was, uh, uh, what is the process of implementing effect of base isolator in ETAPS model? And how to do that in ETAPS model? Um, actually, it, it starts, I mean, you, you have to define uh, Nonlinear link elements, or maybe linear. It depends on the analysis type you want to continue with. I mean, if you if you wish to run an ETAPS model with linear analysis, then uh, you can only use linear properties of base isolation device, which is which can be calculated by the effective uh, properties uh, of a single device. And if you want to continue with the nonlinear uh, analysis, then the nonlinear properties of the isolators should be entered in U2 and U3 direction in ETAPS model, which are the horizontal uh, directions. Uh, that nonlinear parameters are initial stiffness, radius of curvature, and friction coefficient. These values are usually very dependent on the manufacturer. So, uh, they almost always come from the manufacturer, but to to start the initial analysis or to to make some trials, you can simply choose some um, reasonable values. For example, you can choose radius of curvature of three meters, four meters, five meters, six meters, or friction coefficient between four percent to seven percent, six percent. So these are some reasonable values to to make some trials. But other than that. Everything depends on each, everything changes between each project and everything depends on the manufacturer. Uh, the next question, next question is, uh, what are the challenges uh, to apply base isolation in a heritage structure? Uh, yeah, first of all, you, you have to keep protecting the heritage structure while implementing the base isolation devices. So um, I can assume that if you want to isolate the heritage structure, cultural heritage, you, you will have to work underneath that existing building. So the critical thing is in inserting some structural health monitoring equipment to the heritage building. And while you remove the foundation beneath it or holding it uh, with, the, with the jacks, you have to make sure that everything above is still intact and you have to act very carefully. Then underneath, you can do whatever you want, basically, because you can, you can uh, construct a new foundation, put base isolation devices uh, according to your design. Then you can connect those base isolation devices to another, let's say, secondary foundation that is exactly underneath the cultural heritage building. So that is actually what we have uh, done in uh, three of our projects. So the critical part is keeping the 
edit is building intact while you are working underneath. And it, 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 it depends on, again, the uh, design and architectural properties. Uh, there is one more question. Uh, usually, isolators are provided at ground level for the building. So if the building is having basement floor, what is the appropriate level for isolation? Uh, can, can you repeat? I'm sorry. I, I think I missed the question. Uh, uh, the question is, isolators are generally provided at ground level or at the plinth level of the building. Now, if the building is having basements, more number of basements, so what is the appropriate location to provide isolation? Okay, if the idea is to insert isolation in an existing building, it depends on the condition of existing building. If the, uh, if let's say minus four basement columns are quite strong, but minus two basement columns are weak, then I, I, go, I, I say that you should go with the minus four basement. Uh, but if they are all equally weak, again, minus four basement would be much better option because you have to strengthen the, the structural elements underneath the isolator. If we are talking about the new building, then it depends on mostly uh, feasibility. Hmm. For example, if you have to have a lot of groundwork, if you if you choose to put the isolator at the lowest possible level, it, it, it will imply additional costs. If uh, instead you decide to put it on the ground level, then you will not have those costs, but that is a downside that will, that is, that uh, simply is you will have some three, four floors that is, that are not isolated. So if you have, if you don't have any problem damaging those, parts, especially non-structural components, because uh, the structural components will be quite large uh, at the uh, below part of base isolation level since they all have to be linear elastic. If, if it's okay to compromise uh, for those stories, you can, you can put it on, let's say, ground level and uh, three, four stories underneath would not be base isolated. But again, it highly depends on, on the project that we are talking and uh, okay. even, even the usage of, uh, usage of that building. Okay. Uh, then uh, the uh, next question is, uh, is there any upper limit for horizontal movement or base isolators? Uh, this question was asked because uh, the, uh, uh, the person says that we saw furniture moving horizontally in few of the seismic incidences in some video clips elsewhere? Uh, in, in theory, there are no upper limits for displacements. Uh, however, if, okay, if, if you are considering some displacements about one meter, it is usually not applicable in, in other other terms, it, it, it doesn't make much sense, actually. Uh, because you have to have that displacement around the structure. Uh, you have to design everything according to that displacement value. It is, okay, it can be done. It is. It may be possible to apply, but uh, it simply does not make sense because <clears throat> For sure, you will have some better options with uh, with a more sophisticated design, with a more sophisticated approach. For example, okay, the, the seismic zone may be too dangerous, too risky, um, and you have a delicate building. You have to use some low friction devices, and you reach a displacement, like let's say 1.5 meters. Hmm. Uh, but there are solutions to to make them more reasonable to, like, for example, you can reduce them by simply using the uh, additional damping systems. Um, so in theory, there are no limits, but it is not logical to exceed some limits, actually. I mean, 
Yes. Yeah. Okay. There is one more question. Uh, in one of your slides, you have shown that the isolators are placed at different levels. So how to account uh, the level difference in isolation plates? Uh, the level difference does not affect the isolated properties, but it affects the structural elements. For example, you have a huge heater wall uh, underneath you have some isolators and let's say six meters above you have a, a slab connecting to those to that shear wall and at that level you also have isolators so it is that, that is again an architectural choice actually you can simply cut shear wall at that level and put isolators on, on all of the isolators on the same level but if it's not possible, or if it's not feasible, or if it's not preferred, you can simply put isolators underneath the shear wall and keep the other ones on, on some other, other story. The critical thing here is to be able to design the connecting uh, parts of slabs and that shear wall. And it is also uh, critical to to uh, control the forces on that shear wall so that you, you do not create something uh, something wrong. Okay. So uh, keeping them at uh, different levels, uh, is it necessary to have different properties for them also? Or it all depends on the project? Uh, not, not necessarily. It depends on the project. It depends on the uh amount of difference actually if you if you are considering two meter three meters elevation difference it usually is not necessary to make any changes but if you are considering 10 meters difference then it usually is more relieving for the shear walls to use uh, very low friction devices underneath them so it, it uh, relieves some stresses on on the shear wall and especially the some critical node points of the of the structural elements. Uh, in this case, in this case, is it required to provide uh, the damper devices in addition to isolators? Uh, it again um, depends on the project, but mostly depends on the seismicity of the region. If the seismicity is extreme then uh, considering additional dampers is always helpful and most of the time necessary um, or if you are considering a very tall building but with base isolation then um, it is the most in my opinion it is the most sophisticated structural design problem and dampers in those in such cases can be uh, more than useful, actually, a necessity. OK, uh, I think I'll take this last question. Uh, uh, the, the question asked is, we observe that the cap beams are provided on four sides of the isolator. So can you share the importance of it? Uh, the essential thing is to create a rigid diaphragm on the top on top of the isolation level uh, so you can either choose to go with the beams or you can uh, try to go with the very very thick slab like a second foundation but the, but the point is you have to create a rigid diaphragm on top of the on exactly on just at the top of the isolators so it, you will not observe any vertical relative vertical displacement and the entire superstructure may uh, properly act as a rigid body. Uh, Jayan sir, can we ask one more question? Last question. Yes, madam. So what are the basic design check for concrete column head supporting base isolators? Uh, sorry, I didn't, again, 
missed the Apart question. Apart from pairing and bursting. Can, can you please repeat, sorry. Yes. Uh, what are the design check for column, concrete column head supporting base isolator? For example, the question is the relation to pedestals. The question means how the pedestals are designed. Ah, okay. So, um, first of all, the most critical thing is anything below base isolators must always be elastic. So, uh, since they have to remain elastic, without any uh, ductility reduction factors, without any, um, without any reduction in forces, you, in, in the first place, you have some very huge uh, column dimensions to start with. After that, with that uh, huge columns and very um, dense reinforcement, you also have to check the isolators working pressure and the distribution of load on the column, especially in the maximum displacement configuration. If in the maximum displacement configuration due to P delta effects and all the pressure distribution effects, if that uh, columns that you initially designed are not satisfactory, you may need to enlarge them slightly. Uh, but most of the time, the initial analysis and elastic design of columns uh, supersede the um, load distribution due to the isolators. So that is, that is usually the govern, governing uh, part. So that, is, that, is, that requires a couple of steps, but it is not too difficult. OK, thank you very much for your explanation and Presentation, sir. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you, sir, for an insightful knowledge. Uh, so now that we are at the end of the session, I would now request uh, Jay, sir, to please give vote of thanks. Before I give vote of thanks, I must say both the presentations were excellent, very informative, and introducing the new technology to many of us who have not used it, we have definitely heard of it and seen very rarely. So I thank for the excellent presentation. I'm sure all of the participants will take some inspiration from this webinar 125 and start thinking about the application in the projects what we have in hand. Of course, we discussed just before the webinar that in India, normally architects are the team leader and if it is building industry, it is driven by a builder. So we need to conduct such webinars for architects and builders so that they are also upgraded with this latest available system. Next slide. So I thank Sandeep Shah. Basically, he's the person who initiated this topic when he was attending the last webinar on performance-based design. So Sandeep, thank you so much. Because of your initiation, this could happen. He only talked to Urza and ensured that he comes for this lecture. And it was, it was complimentary. I must thank Taruja Bandiwadekar because she is a person who has worked, done some research on this. And her moderating was definitely useful for all the participants. There were many senior members in panelists as well as the participants. I am not remembering, I mean, I'm not able to take names of all, but I thank all the senior members. And of course, all the participants, they were from faculty, there were some students. So I thank them all. And this is not end of the webinar. You can also get associated with us as Epicons consultant. We are in proof checking of tall building, structural audit, assessment and entity, concrete quality monitoring services, project management consultancy services, and of course, training through EFC, like Sandeep suggested this topic and we picked it up and it has become a good success. 
So I request all other participants. We will be sharing your feedback form. Please complete that and send it back. Immediately after that, in the next week, you will get the presentation as well as the, this particular has been recorded and that will put on our YouTube channel. Thank you so much.